Friends, welcome. Um, to the practice of the Divine Mother. So I was, <clears throat> actually I've spent the morning at the ashram doing initiation stuff. So I'm really filled up with some Shakti. Granted, I didn't have to leave before I actually got my initiation, but you know, I was there at the beginning. I was like, I have to go teach the Divine Mother instead of sitting in experiencing the Divine Mother <laughs> with community. Um, so welcome to those who are new to the space. Welcome. Um, those who are returning, welcome. Um, again, this is the practice. I guess it's called the Divine Mother. It just changes every day for me. Um, and this is a practice. It's not necessarily Tara practice. This is more about leaning into the essence of um, the sacred mother, the divine mother, uh, which is this expression of space and fluidity and movement and potential. And today, so we're not, I don't think we're gonna chant anything today, but I think we're gonna actually just work with a little bit of Kundalini do some kundalini work. Um, kundalini is an expression of shakti. Shakti is it's the it's so many ways to to think about shakti. Shakti is energy, absolutely, but shakti is the universal, the expression, the universal. Um, it's the consciousness of the mother, I would say, in one way, the consciousness of the mother, the intelligent, awakened, conscious energy of the mother that is deeply imbued with love, right? So it's an expression of love, it's an expression of an awakened, um, intelligent energy that holds everything, is in everything, it's not the only energy, right, in, in the universe that we're working with, uh, but it's a very strong energy that we're working with. Um, so when we st start thinking about Kundalini, Kundalini is often thought of as how Shakti arises in the body. So you often say, you often hear people say, oh, Kundalini Shakti, you know, our, our Shakti Kundalini. Um, and that's the awakening of the consciousness of the mother um, in the physical body. But that awakening is also happening in the energetic body, you know, as well. We often start that awakening work um, at the base of the spine, you know, right around um, the root chakra. And the traditional, traditional iconography um, of Shakti are like, you know, the two snakes um, circling around um, the spine or the central column um, of the energy body, right? So it's like awakening these two primordial, you know, um, energies that begin to circle up um, the spine, um, which is the spine runs parallel to the central channel. Um, as well. So this is kind of some of the stuff that we're going to be working with. You know, we've, I quite frankly do Kundalini all the time with people. I just don't call it Kundalini. I just say, we're just going to practice. And that's what we do, <laughs> you know. But so much of this work is about learning to like really hold the awakening of the mother. It's about learning how to lean into the consciousness of the mother, right? Because it can be a really subtle, nuanced experience. Like, so it's not like you start doing the practice and you have what we would call a kundalini awakening, right? When you just start having experiences. Like, that's not necessarily the situation for a lot of us. But instead, it's very subtle, right? And this is what we're trying to develop a sensitivity to, the subtle 
nature or the subtle way in which energy awakens and moves and arises, right? And of course, the best way to do that is through training and meditation, you know. Um, for me, meditation is my root practice, right? So amongst everything that I train in and practice in, from like magic to, you know, tantra, you know, and other stuff, <laughs> you know, plant medicine, um, the root, my root practice is meditation, right? So that's what I'm grounded in. Um, and, you know, and hopefully I should be grounded in it if I'm like a, a Buddhist teacher, but you would be really surprised. Now, this isn't a time that I'm talking shit about other teachers, right? But you would be surprised at how many Buddhist teachers don't know how to meditate, actually, you know? Like, it was, it's surprising, <laughs> right? Um how you can bypass this essential work, labor, of actually becoming aware of one's mind, right? Learning how to notice and experience. It's, you know, it's really bizarre. A lot of teachers know how to quote texts of meditation, but they don't know how to speak from experience because they don't have any <laughs> experience, right? Um, and I hate to say that, but, like, it's just really, you just kind of have to name all of this stuff. You know, um, so so that's Kundalini, that's awakening, um, and there's something else also uh, about. It just slipped my mind. It was like it was right in the forefront of my mind, and I was just gonna like put it out there, um, but I'm sure it'll come back at another point. Um, as well. So this is like this arising, this awakening um, of Kundalini. Now, <clears throat> one sign of Kundalini awakening uh, is often joy, joy, pleasure, happiness. Um, that's often associated with this as well. So if you start feeling some of that, you know, then they're, they're then that's kind of like one of the signs you know, that kind of awakening um, in the body as well. Um, I think that's it in terms of, like, opening. Um, I want to, before we actually continue, I would love to offer uh, this song, Kirtan. I've been singing Kirtan all morning and so I was like I'm gonna do kirtan now um, with everyone else so I'm putting into the chat here the lyrics to the song this is CC white um, CC white um, is uh, a black um, female kirtan artist she actually does kirtan soul is what she's known for so kirtan kirtan is this kind of more contemporary, popular, like folk, religious music that we find um, in India and Vedic spiritual spaces. Um, that as soon as it hit the West, it started turning into all kinds of stuff. So we have like kirtan soul, hip hop kirtan, children's kirtan, you name it, we have it. Um, I think Russell Simmons put out a kirtan album um, as well, hip-hop kirtan. Um, so it's it's a lot happening, but I love C.C. White because uh, she takes a lot of traditional kirtan and she brings the church because she, she's like, she's a singer, she's a gospel singer, right? But she's bringing that into the work. So the song, as you see, Ma, um, the Ma chant is gorgeous, really gorgeous um, kirtan um, that I want to start our practice with today. So I'm going to play it from here. We all 
come into the world through the mother. She is our first guru. Her mantra, her heartbeat, her love and ever renewing source. Let us remember Ma. This chant is for the mother, the mother in a soul. This chant is for the mother, the mother in us all. This chant is for the mother, the mother in us all. We take refuge as your sons and daughters. When I think a mother, I chant. Yeah. 
And that song can be found <clears throat> on Spotify and Apple Music um, as well, and probably YouTube, too. So I have done many, you know, uh, sessions, ceremonies, uh, meditations uh, with that song, right? And it's been a catalyst for um, a lot of opening um, for me in my personal practice. And we often talk about, you know, how do we cut through this kind of relative understanding of mother, you know, mother in terms of guardians or people who raised us, you know, um, how do we cut through some of the wounding, the wounding that some of us carry from the harm we, we've experienced from being, from being mothered, right? You know, and how do we transcend into this universal, expanded, awakened consciousness of the mother, right? And it takes a lot of faith to actually transcend into this more awakened experience of the mother, which means like we're not bypassing the woundedness or the trauma, but it means that we're like, we're having to move through it, right? You know, we move through the storm of the hurt to get to the clarity of the spaciousness, right? Because essentially the mother, right, is holding everything, including the trauma, you know, that we've experienced from mothering, having been mothered, right? So, so much of the practices, and I say this in every practice, actually, so much of what we have to do is actually hold the pain, hold the discomfort, right? Learning how to disrupt reactivity and to move into a space where we're choosing how to experience, to experience and let go, right? And that's, that's the tantric path, that's the Buddhist path. It's like we, no matter what it is, and I know this is a really hard one to, to, to deal with, but like the truth of everything is that you have to train to experience everything. Like, even the shit that we don't want to deal with, you know, until we're able to train like that, then we won't ever begin to experience the kind of liberation that we need to experience, right? This doesn't mean <laughs> that from this point on, you're going to be like experiencing everything, including the most intense trauma. That's not what that means either. It means that we take our time. We gather our resources together to support us in doing this work, right? Of course, the lineage that I 
study and practice yoga in um, is called Kashi. Uh, and some of you have heard me talk about the founder um, of this lineage, the school, uh, Majas, Ma Jaya Sati Bhagavati, um, who I have, I have a tendency to really like find these teachers who are just really out there. Who are just like not even like on the register of anything, <laughs> you know. Um, but Ma was like this white Jewish woman who grew, who was born in like the '30s or the '40s or something, and was just extraordinary, you know. Controversial, right? Because she was hard headed, <laughs> you know. Um, but she just started awakening. You know, in her 20s, I think, um, in 30s, just started like having visions. I mean, she started practicing yoga, you know, just by chance. And that just triggered this awakening, you know, um, and, you know, was really revered by, you know, so many of the teachers back then, including Ram Das, um, Krishna Das, you know, people like that. You know, and of course the Indian gurus as well. She was recognized by them. But Ma taught, has this teaching where she used to say, you know, you have to consume everything. Like consume everything. And that has been such a central teaching for me, particularly in, in what we're talking about now and having to experience. Because when I think about consuming everything it means that like i'm trying to experience everything right if i don't attempt to experience everything then those things will attempt to experience me which another way of saying is that it's going to consume me and it's hard to touch the mother to experience the mother when we're being consumed by the pain right and not just the pain but also the pleasure the joy you know we're not trying to allow things to to overwhelm and consume us even if it feels great what we're doing in this path is learning how to let go of reactivity and to transition to a space of responsiveness so in my awareness I am holding all these experiences right and so much of not just the eight limbs of yoga, but the physical exercise, which is one limb of yoga, like the physical asana of yoga is actually about training the body to hold, to learn how to hold experience, you know? We often say that it's also about training the body to hold shakti, you know, as well, right? Like to hold like not to not to react not to like you know what to flinch right but to hold to experience to allow you know the world seems really overwhelming right now because so many of us actually don't know how to hold really intense energy you know we don't know how to hold the despair the sorrow right the hopelessness Right, but if you don't hold it, then it starts holding you. And that's again another way of saying that these things start consuming you. And then you just you're just in a habitual cycle of reactivity. You know. Like it's like like swimming, right? You know, it's like you get thrown in water and you don't and you don't it's not that you don't know how to swim, it's that you're not a good swimmer. You know, so you get thrown in water and you're just like, you're just like struggling to stay afloat, right? And that's what it feels like for many of us right now. Like we're struggling to stay afloat, right? But to float in this case means that we learn how to hold, to allow, which is what you do. You know, and swimming, particularly in drown proofing, like that's one of the first things you learn how to do is float. You know, and to float, you just kind of have to let go. You know, like you have to see, you have to see everything that's arising as something that you can float on top of. 
you know, to let the body expand. Like when you're full, you just like expand outward, right? And, and allow the body to rise. And this is what we're doing in our practice. We're allowing ourselves to expand and rise. And then we start consuming, we start holding all of this, you know? And that's the mother. Like the expansion, the floating, the, the holding, that is, that's the expression, the awakening of the mother here, right? And so much of our work as practitioners um, is learning how to recognize how the mother arises for us. Letting go of these preconceived notions about what the mother is. You know, because for me, what I had to learn in my practice is that the blessings of the mother often comes with a lot of discomfort. You know? So when I am opening and beginning to float and hold space, when I feel that discomfort arising, I say, oh, that's the blessing of the mother. Right? And Tantra, in Buddhist Tantra, you know, Tibetan Buddhist Tantra, we say that's the blessing of the Lama. You know? Like when we're allowed to notice the suffering and to choose how to be in relationship to the suffering, that is the blessing of the Lama, is the blessings of the mother, right? To have the capacity to do that. Now, uh, Cece's song, um, the Ma Chan is, is bhakti, you know, it's bhakti yoga, it's heart, it's devotion, right? When I think about the mother, right, to have that awakening when I think about the mother, what is the mother, what happens for me when I think about the mother, right? And this is where we're going to start, actually, as we start kind of moving into our practice. Like, when I think about Ma, in this case, the mother, Ma, like, what do I think of? What's my experience right now? And it's no right or wrong here. It's like, when I think about the mother, what do I think of? What comes up for me? Just a few minutes here, you know, just reflecting on that. a couple more seconds, right? When I think of Ma, what, what do I think of?
Okay. So we're going to start transitioning into practice, and it won't be a long practice because it's going to be a little bit intense, but we're going to be working with the breath. So we're going to be doing some pranayama. And pranayama is breath work. And pranayama is breath work. And so much, like so much of this tradition of tantric traditions are really based on the breath because the breath and um, prana are yoked together, which is a form of yoga. So pranayama is a form of yoga, actually. And prana is life force energy. And then often I think of prana as being very neutral, you know, um, energy. And shakti you know, is very nurturing, very like much more aligned with space and awakening and fluidity. And prana is just, it's life force. It's like this very basic neutral energy that, again, everything, you know, um, is composed of prana as well. So prana, as we used to say, prana rides the breath. Right, but prana rides anything in our bodies that moves. Anything that's fluid. So including breath, also blood, circulation, right? The way fluids move through the body. Prana also rides thoughts, emotions, things that move, things that change. That's prana, right? But the most potent vehicles for prana is the breath, right? So this is why there's such intense focus on the breath. And, you know, if the breath is really difficult right now, you know, just take it easy with this, you know, um, as we get into this a little more, okay? So as we work with the breath, we're working with prana. We're using prana to beginning to begin to awaken Kundalini Shakti in the body. And again, the subtleness of everything is really important. You know, it's it's initially very difficult to discern the difference between these kinds of energies, right? But again. Training and meditation helps us to develop a really fine awareness, right? To be, so we begin to identify shakti from prana or, you know, wrathful energy from peaceful energy, you know, or the levels of consciousness, which are just frequencies of energy within the mind, right? And these are just very subtle shifts. that are easy to miss, you know. Um, at this point in my personal practice, I'm much better at recognizing what energies are dominant for me, and that helps me to really figure out how to take care of myself in the moment, right? Or what I should and shouldn't be doing. Like, if I'm experiencing certain levels of energy, and I'm not going to be driving a car, you know, or having a conversation, you know. Um, so knowing energy levels like that and experiences of energy really can help us quite a bit, okay? So let's, be, let's begin. <clears throat> and again, always beginning with allowing your body to come into a position that feels appropriate for you. You know, be that lying down, sitting, standing, or it may be. And I like to also just begin my practice just by offering a prayer to the mother, right? Just praying for guidance, right? For awakening. 
you know I pray for to be more devoted right to the expression of the mother and it's okay if that for some of us if we when, you, when we think about the mother we get a specific image like Tara right or a particular teacher you know so often when I think when I'm offering prayers to the mother I am thinking about Majaya you know who I never met in this life um, but is still a teacher so when I think about Ma when I think about the mother I think about Majaya her teaching her guidance and the love that I feel from her like that's very strong bhakti is a very strong yoga for me and practice so offering those prayers and when we offer those prayers we're also calling into the space this awakened energy of the mother the consciousness of the mother we may not feel this but this is definitely happening you know So allowing the consciousness of the mother to begin to awaken even this early in our practice. So when you're ready, I invite you to shift to calling in to your space, your homecoming circle, or your benefactor. So calling into the space, all the beings who love you, right? Be it teachers, gurus, elders, um, mentors, right? saints, deities, ancestors, you know, particularly benevolent, helpful ancestors, right? We're only calling into the space beings that can help us right now, who can offer this energy of care, not beings who are trying to take resources from us. So if you feel those beings coming into the circle, just restrict them, block them, say thank you, but not right now. I'm only inviting beings who can offer support in my practice right now. Of course, we're calling in the earth and all the elements as well. <clears throat> Calling in your lineages as well. You know, so our lineages are just all the beings who are a part of something that's important for us that we're practicing. You know, or calling in maybe our lineage of activists that we're inspired by, our lineage of artists. Um, and also um, making more of an intention to call in my queer ancestry and my indigenous ancestry as well, or lineages, indigenous lineages, um, and queer lineages. And just opening and imagining that the space around you begins to be filled with these benefactors. And you don't have to see anything, you know, or necessarily feel anything. Just know that if you call, they're there. And they're here with us.
when you're ready, inviting your benefactors, this homecoming circle of beings around you, to begin to radiate the energy of care into the space around you. You can experience that energy in any way that feels appropriate for you. But connecting to that energy of care, which is this profound energy of love or compassion or concern. Right? And slowly we begin to imagine that we're absorbing this energy of care into our bodies. So we're held within this experience of deep care and we're filled with this experience of deep care. And of course, this is a point in the practice where we we're wanting to let go, to surrender a little more to this experience. This is part of the floating, right? How can I allow myself just to kind of float here on this sea, you know, of care? To be held, to be sustained, to be, you know, tended to, really. So we're going to just shift into some breath work now, to our, our pranayama practice. And to begin with, I invite you to first shift your attention to the base of your spine. Just a gentle shifting, a gentle noticing. Becoming aware of this line, this channel that extends from the base of the spine to the top of the head. And this extension being the central channel of the energy body, the central channel where all of the, the channels in the body run into and out of. And then slowly I invite you to begin imagining that you're breathing up and down that channel. So breathing up from the base of the spine to the very top of the head then as we exhale, allowing our attention and the breath to gently float back down to the base of the spine. I'm just connecting to that channel, again, which runs parallel to the spine. So sometimes feeling the physical spine, but knowing because of our intention here, that we're actually channeling up and down in the central channel itself. And 
you know, often the difference between the physical body and the energy body is just a thought. You know, a thought is what we need to transition into working with the energy body. So if we think we're breathing up and down the central channel, then we are. Okay, a few more breaths here. <clears throat> So we'll slowly begin to transition a little deeper into the practice. And working deeper with the breath. So just as an overview, we're going to begin working with the base of the spine, the root chakra. And we're going to be moving up the rest of the six chakras, uh, moving up the body. So the root chakra at the base of the spine, then moving up into the pelvis, the second chakra, and the navel area, the third chakra, the heart chakra, the throat chakra, uh, the, um, uh, the central eye, the third eye chakra, and the very top of the head, the brahmacharya. But returning our attention back to the base of the spine. So we're going to start imagining that all this energy of care that we've been absorbing, we're going to imagine that that energy is going to be channeled and concentrated first down in the root chakra, again, the base of the spine. Just feeling that energy just being absorbed down, low into the body. Right? And as we turn our attention back to the breath, as we inhale, this is as if we're inhaling from the base of the spine. So we're inhaling all the energy of care into the base of the spine. And then when we move through the inhale, we hold the breath at the base of the spine for at least five seconds. And as we hold the breath for five seconds, we're concentrating and intensifying the energy of care, which in turn is beginning to awaken right the base of the spine, the root chakra. So an inhaling into the base, the spine, holding. And then just releasing. So there are a lot of things that can start happening now. A lot of like energy is being stirred up um, and that includes emotional energy as well um, a lot of physical awakening sensations will start to arise but if you ever feel lightheaded here then it's important that you take a break and just move through some simple, slow movements. Maybe get a drink of water, take a stretch, and then you feel resourced enough, you can return back to the practice. 
if you want. So just a few more breaths here, inhaling into the base of the spine, holding that breath, intensifying the energy of care in the root chakra. Just releasing. And then inhaling again, holding. Releasing. And so on the next breath, we'll inhale and hold. And then as we exhale, we're going to send this energy up the central channel out the top of the head. Okay. So inhaling, holding, and then releasing that breath up the central channel out the top of the head. So let's do this a few times. You can move at your own pace as well. Just a few more times here. So one of the things that's happening is that we're actually changing the frequency of energy um, in the body and in our minds. So when we start feeling lightheaded or ungrounded, then that's a sign that energy frequency is changing. It's getting higher, actually. The higher the frequency is, the more ungrounded, the lighter we feel you may start feeling really like spacious and wide and expanded, which makes it hard to hold on to details. You know, it also makes it hard to hold on to thoughts, which is one of the great things about these higher levels, right? But it can be challenging if we're new to this as well. So another grounding practice is to just shift your attention to the weight of the body, right? To the sensation of the body and the seats, you know, coming together. And so again, Returning our attention to the base of the spine. Inhaling into the base, the energy of care. And so we're imagining now that this chakra is like really being filled with care, love, compassion, whatever that feels like for you. Holding the breath and releasing at your own pace. And so these breaths 
are beginning to awaken the chakra. So the activity changes, the energy, the speed, that the energy, depending on the model that you study, you know, is swirling in the chakra begins to get quicker, faster. And that impacts the physical body as well as the mental body of thoughts and emotions. So when you finish your current breath, I invite you just to come back into just a brief space of rest and resetting before we continue. So as we come back into the practice now, we're going to be working with sending energy up the chakra, the main seven chakras that we're focusing on now. And this, we're working on awakening, right? So we're awakening the quality of energy, Kundalini, in this case, Kundalini Shakti, right? And so to begin with, as we begin this later stage of the practice, I invite you to imagine <clears throat> in the seven chakras that there are closed lotuses in these chakras. And these closed lotuses are the color of the chakra itself. As we move through the practice, I'll remind you and everything. So, so you don't have to see them clearly now, but just knowing that in the chakras are these closed lotuses. So a red lotus in the root chakra, right? And then um, uh, um, orange, I'm sorry, an orange um, lotus in the pelvis, and then yellow, a lotus in um, the third chakra, the solar plexus, and then green lotus in the heart chakra, right? And the blue closed lotus in the throat, an indigo lotus in the third eye, and a violet lotus on top of the head. And these closed lotuses represent the sleeping chakra that we're going to bloom and awaken through Kundalini. All right, so shifting back down <clears throat> to the root chakra, which is red. So in the root chakra, there's a red closed lotus. So imagining again, breathing into, inhaling into the root chakra, this energy of care, holding the breath. And as we hold the breath, we imagine that this intensified energy begins to blossom, this red lotus. And so just releasing the breath when you're ready. So we're going to get into a kind of a pattern here, you know, that we're setting up, which will allow this to go. This is going to start speeding up a little more, okay? So again, we imagine inhaling into the root chakra, Holding the breath there, imagining the awakening 
of this red lotus. And then when you get ready to exhale, imagine that you're exhaling the energy of care up into the second chakra, into the pelvis area, right into this closed orange lotus. So once that energy has been breathed, exhaled up into the second lotus, we're going to inhale again. So inhaling the energy of care into that closed orange lotus, holding again. And as we hold the breath, imagining that this orange lotus begins to blossom and awaken. And when we're ready to exhale, exhaling that energy up into the third chakra, into the yellow closed lotus. Okay. So taking just a natural breath in between each lotus before we begin working with it again to reset. Okay. So again, starting again, inhaling into that closed orange lotus, the energy of care. Holding the breath there, feeling the intensity, awakening that orange lotus. And when you're ready to exhale, exhaling that energy up into the heart chakra. Taking a natural breath. And returning back to the heart chakra, into that closed green lotus, beginning to inhale deeply into that closed lotus again, holding the breath, feeling the intensity of that energy blossom and awaken that green lotus. When you're ready, exhaling that energy up to the throat chakra. Right, into the blue closed lotus. Taking natural breath. And turning our attention back to the throat chakra. In the blue closed lotus, inhaling into that closed lotus, holding, intensifying that energy, awakening and blossoming with this blue lotus in the throat. And then exhaling this energy up into the third eye to this closed indigo colored lotus. Taking a breath, a natural breath. And turning our attention back to the third eye, the closed indigo lotus. Inhaling into that lotus, the energy of care. Holding. Intensifying, awakening, blossoming that lotus. When you're ready to exhale, exhaling up to the seventh chakra, into the closed violet lotus. Taking a few natural breaths. And returning our attention back to that seventh chakra and the closed violet lotus. 
Inhaling that energy again into the closed lotus, folding, blossoming that lotus. When you're ready, you're going to exhale that energy up and out the top of the head. Taking a few natural breaths. So again, returning our attention back down to the base of the spine, to the now blossomed red lotus. We're going to imagine inhaling again into that chakra, holding the breath. And this time, when you get ready to exhale, imagine that you're exhaling this energy all the way up through all the chakras out the top of the head. And when you imagine that energy leaving the top of the head, I want you to imagine that, that like a kind of, Mm, expression of rainbow light leave the, leaves the top of the head as if like you're like gushing rainbow light out the top of the head right so again inhaling deeply at the base of the root chakra holding intensifying when you're ready sing that energy up central channel through the chakras out the top of the head gushing rainbow light into the space above our heads and continuing to work here you know continuing to do that breath and while we're doing that actually i'm going to play um, the Ma chant again. And again, I want you to explore what it means to just kind of let go, right? As your chakra system is open, Kundalini has this channel now to move, to flow from the, the root chakra to the very top of our chakra system and out. So continuing with that practice and also listening again to the song. We all come into the world through the mother. She is our first guru. Her mantra, her heartbeat, her love and ever renewing source. Let us remember Ma. This chant is for the mother, the mother in a soul. This chant is for the mother, the mother in us all. When I think of mother, I chant mother. This 
its chant is for the mother. We remember, Ma. The mother and the soul. This chant is for the mother, the mother in us all. We take refuge as your sons and daughters. When I think a mother, I cheer. All right, coming back, if you haven't already, to a natural breath. 
Shifting our attention down to the seat, noticing the weight of the body, making contact with the seat, really how the seat is rising to hold you and to take care of you in this moment. Noticing the earth under you as well. Letting the seat and the earth ground you as you kind of move into just reawakening the body through some simple, slow movement. Right. So just coming back into the space, just regrounding. Um, getting some water is really nice. So you know we're we're about to to end our session. So <clears throat> getting some water, taking a short walk. Doing some more movement are great ways to come back down into the body, back down into the relative in case you, you took a long journey somewhere. <laughs> something you probably did. <laughs> um, come back. Come back now. Um, when, when I practice with my Swami, like, it's just like, she just takes you, she throws you off into somewhere, you know, and you can like barely get out of the, out of this, the practice space afterwards, you know, um, I hope that's not the case. I hope we don't have anywhere to go right now. Um, thank you, um, for your practice. I mean, we're a little bit out of time, but if there's a question, I can just do one quick question if there's something that real people really need to get to ask before we end our time together. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask sort of on that note, what do you recommend when you do have that spaciousness? Like how to like most kindly integrate it. Sometimes it feels jarring. Yes. And, and I like, I want to welcome the disorientation mm -hmm. and, and it's like a ride sometimes. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'd love to hear. Yeah. Well, just like very tangible things, you know, grounded in mindfulness, right? So it's like, if you get up and walk, Think about it. Like, this is what my body feels like. This is the sensation. Like, just getting really into noticing everything is how we stay really connected to, you know, something holding and tangible, right? So don't just get up and don't think about it. Think about everything. Pl even planning, like, I'm going to go to this other room and this is how I'm going to do it. Right, you know, and I know some of you who, you know, who, if you do ceremony work, right, in ceremony, that's what you kind of have to do. You know, it's just like you can't go on autopilot because for the first time, like these, some of these practices actually bring us into the body. And so we have to think differently now. It's like you just can't skip off. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm moving. What is that like? <laughs> you know, what's going on? right i just can't put everything on autopilot like i have to be with everything now 
you know. And then, of course, the basic things, water, you know, um, lying down, taking a break, just moving very slowly is how we work with this, you know. Often when you're working in groups, like, there are, people will be like, just don't talk to me afterwards. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not here to have a conversation. I don't, you know, I don't even know where I'm at. And that's fine. You know, we're trying to integrate these higher levels of consciousness, which is actually touching into the mother, into our daily lives, right? Um, and for some of us, like, that's going to be really jarring, absolutely really disorienting, really disrupting. That's kind of the point, right? Um, because we're so, we're too invested in like the relative rigidity of things. And what these practices introduce us to is the expansion, the fluidity of everything, right? But we're not, our work isn't, to bypass the relative to hang out in this really exp expansive, fluid experience is to integrate this experience into our lives so there's spaciousness in the things that we're doing so we don't feel, again, consumed by the rigidity. Right? And of course, what that does, it, bring, it highlights the things that, like, I don't need to be doing or the things I have to divest from, right? You know, and you do these practices over a long period of time and everything just changes. You know, that's the consequence, right? I'm, I'm a living example of what years of these practices do. Like it just reorients everything, right? Um, there are consequences to that. You know, if I didn't have to deal with being in the world, it would be great. Like, if I didn't have to, like, pay bills and clean my house and get food and talk to people, great. Wonderful. I can just live right in this expansion. No problem. But I actually have to be in the world, <laughs> right? I have to get from point A to point B. And so I have to work really hard to ground myself, you know, to ground this energy, right? To have the view and experience of spaciousness, but also have the logistics and the methods to keep moving through the relative at the same time. And this is why it's so easy to bypass. That's why you get into like these spiritual communities grounded in these practices, and you just see people just going off into emptiness and hanging out there, right? Which is wonderful, but like you're still here. You know, was it, I think Jack Hornfield, you know, wrote that book, you know, was it Ecstasy and then the Laundry, what's it called? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's true. It's like you have these great experiences, now you have to come back and do laundry, <laughs> you know, and cook dinner and go to work. You know, after the Ecstasy, the Laundry, yep. Yeah. Excellent. That's like, that's like the most perfect title for this this experience you know so I, i'm the uh, rachel you have something yeah i just put i'm going to put something in the chat and i just wanted to say that i'm doing it that came through my um, email box this morning about why especially with the mother if you um you know, when primal knowing is wounded or missing, an immense doubt is often created about our own and God's foundational goodness. Yeah. And I'm just going to pop that in there for anybody who wants to read it, um, because I think that's where a lot of the scared, shitless feeling comes when you actually finally access the space and you actually could surrender there can be this huge contraction that, that's left over from day one of your life. So this just came through this morning and I thought it was profound. It was profound for me. So I just wanted to share it. Yeah, who is this yeah. from? Um, it came from Richard Rohr's um, oh, okay. daily blog. And I don't know who he's quoting. Mean, he's talking about Winnicott. I don't remember who he's quoting precisely, but it's his daily blog today. Okay. 
And I just thank you so much for this, Lionel Rod. I just want to say that and thank you to everybody who's here because it's just wonderful. And well, to Eric. Richard Gore is a fan of mine. <laughs> I don't doubt <laughs> I've been I've been featured twice and all of my Christian friends lose it when <laughs> come across that blog. <laughs> I didn't know it was like a big deal. <laughs> Yeah, he's amazing. He's a non-dual Christian. How many yeah. of those are there on the planet? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway. So I've, I've been surprised. So he's featured me twice. On wow. The, the That's cool. Yeah, so, so, but yeah, thank you for that. This is really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned that a lot about getting past the, the birth mother and it's, it's so rooted in our nervous system. So I just appreciate what you're doing. I just... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we'll bring our time to a close. Um, Eric has posted everything. Um, there will not be a practice next month, so we'll be away on retreats, uh, but we'll pick up again in October. Um, again, join me tomorrow for Medicine Buddha, where we continue um, these practices as well. Um, anything else, Eric, that we need to share? Thank you all for being here. Keep an eye out for some updates and reminders, um, some MailChimp stuff, upcoming issue of the Boomi Sparsha Garden blog, retreat information all coming out pretty soon. So keep the sense gates open. We're busy. We're busy now. <laughs> um, so we have much more coming down the line in the fall as well. So, so we're getting going. We have the foundation, you know, um, and I'm almost through with this book. So I'm gonna have a lot of like a little more space back. Um, but but thank you all so much. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow night for Medicine Buddha. You know. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your practice, especially. You know. <laughs>